My colleague Cheryl Kempler is our archivist and is perhaps best positioned to delve into B'nai B'rith's history. Uh, Cheryl, great to have you with us today. Thank you. Well, tell us what circumstances led to the formation of B'nai B'rith in 1843. Well, you know, there, it, the tip of the iceberg has been reached right now. A lot has been written about the genesis of B'nai B'rith, but I think that in the future, we're going to know more and more about it. What I like to do is personalize uh, this time in American history and in Jewish history to kind of see why did men get together to form this kind of brotherhood. And, you know, you think about the 1840s and all over the world, this was the time when people were becoming modern in their thoughts. They were leaving the religious faith-based life behind and they were thinking about themselves as individuals. And this was certainly true of the German Jewish men who immigrated to America. They were free from kind of the strictures of their small towns or big cities where people were making sure that they adhered to the rules. When they got here, this was a big anonymous city. They certainly still identified as Germans and as Jews, but they found, well, maybe they didn't have to go to synagogue on Friday night. Maybe they could eat that food. Maybe they could wear something that was prohibitive, but they still wanted to maintain their Jewishness. And they also were thinking about all the visionary philosophies of the time, this brotherhood of man, and they wanted a part of that too but as Jews. So a group of 12 men, not rich men, but school teachers, uh, small merchants, uh, barbers, they all got together. They were all congregants in Anshachesas and, and they said to themselves, how will we make life better? How will we improve humanity? Uh, as Jews, and they decided to form this little brotherhood band, like the Masons, like the Odd Fellows, like many other groups at the time. And you can think of the American Transcendentalists, they wanted the same thing. And so they formed what was like a safe space. So the men could go to each other and say, what do I wear for this job interview? How can I learn English? What will make me a successful American? At the same time as this individual need, they were thinking about their families, what would happen if they died, what about the community. So this accomplished everything, and it must have worked very well, because not only were lodges being formed throughout New York, but as importantly, on the western borders of the United States, first Ohio, then all the way out to Denver and California, because this was this group was what Jews needed, something to improve humanity while finding out ways to be, still become still be Jewish. Uh, the synagogue was for talking and prayer and for discussion, but B'nai B'rith was for action. It was for getting things done. During the next century, which takes us into the 20th century, uh, B'nai B'rith and its lodges grew and its mission was expanded. Um, did its membership change as well in, in this and in other countries? Well, of necessity, it had to, because the lodges were working, men were becoming more successful. So those who joined the lodges were joining for other things. They were joining for big projects, uh, building uh, orphanages, hospitals, uh, uh, homes for the aged, and these men had to be more affluent. And, and they became affluent partially through the B'nai B'rith. So yes, we changed. We were no longer a middle-class uh, organization, but we were still, we still maintained our German Jewish roots. I mean, if you look at some of the literature, the lodge meetings, the activities, everyone always had this nostalgic feeling for German culture. And in Europe and in Asia, lodges were being formed from the 1880s on, and they had a little bit more stringent requirements. These men, they could be merchants, they could be salespeople, they could be businessmen. But what I find often is that they had to demonstrate an erudition. So, for example, in Germany, the president of the Berlin Lodge was Maximilian Stein, and he was a brewer. He supplied all the beer to the German army during World War I. But he wasn't just that. He was a philosopher, and he wrote many books parsing the B'nai B'rith philosophy, and they were adhered to. This is what people were reading in Germany. So it was every member had to be able to lecture to the group, whether it was on the music of Schubert 
or Goethe or Jewish theology or the Bible or Emma Lazarus. They all had to do this, unlike the United States. And I think that's what makes for the amazing B'nai B'rith culture of the European lodges and also in Asia, where the, everything was entirely different. In the Asian districts, you had to be able to speak all sorts of languages, and you had to also maintain relationships, good relationships with people in charge, the Pasha, the Sultan, and you, ha you had to be able to do these things in a very rudimentary society as well. So th this would make a fascinating study. I think that uh, it's it's part of it's part of world history. You see what B'nai B'rith during World War I saved thousands of lives just by feeding people and more opening up medical clinics, helping refugees to repatriate, helping people during earthquakes, fires. It's just amazing how much they did with so little. Of course, they were supported by the Washington, by the American lodges and by the German lodges, but with that money, they were able to do miraculous things. So towards the end of the 19th century, we became an international organization. Then the 20th century, really an international organization, as we began to have uh, members of lodges in Latin America and, and in the Middle East and, and other places. Um, were there times in which lodge brothers or leaders uh, from the U.S. and those in other countries ever got together, perhaps through conventions uh, that were especially earmarked for this purpose? Well, in the case of the Supreme Grand Lodge president, meaning our president here, they regularly made visits to both Europe and Asia. And in fact, sometimes uh, our president, like Jules Bien, he earmarked a lot of um, projects for Asian lodges. But what was, I think, more interesting is that from the 19 teens on, there were these great spas in Poland, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Bad Nauheim, and um, uh, Marienbad, Carlsbad. And this is where affluent Jewish people and also non-Jewish people spent their summers. And I read in an article in our magazine that the merchants put out big signs in their windows Welcome B'nai B'rith. And this is where men from all over Europe and the United States got together at these summer resorts. And they would have special meetings every week that brought everyone together. And it was, it was said that the quality of these meetings were unusually high because everyone from every place could bring their experience, their understanding of Judaism, their understanding of culture at the time together and discuss it. I think this is this is this would also make a great book in itself to find these kinds of records. And there's some articles in our magazine, a, a dentist from Kansas City, uh, he writes about going to Marion Bad and mingling with the European Lodge brothers and finding how amazingly well educated they were. And also says that some of the lodge um uh, I, the lodge ritual was different, and he found that quite interesting as well. We had amazing lodge rituals with uh, the iconography being parsed. It, I, we'd have to start way back and analyze that too. Much of B'nai B'rith in Europe was destroyed along with the rest of uh, a large portion of European Jewry during the Holocaust. The post-Holocaust rebirth and expansion of B'nai B'rith in Europe, in hindsight, uh, seems like a near miracle. Uh, how was it realized? Well, you know, as much as I can identify with the German men who came in the 1840s and wanted some freedom, it's much harder for me to understand what happened. But uh, there's a lovely artifact in our uh, collections. It's a tiny notebook from France. And just hours after the armistice, it shows uh, uh, leaders and members of B'nai B'rith France going door to door to addresses to where former members lived. They were already, people who had just even sat down from the armistice and were trying to collect their thoughts. They were running around trying to reconstitute B'nai B'rith. And if you were there in Europe and maybe you had been in a camp or maybe you had survived, you were thinking, maybe you were thinking, why should I do this again? Why should I move, march towards humanity, as Dr. Beck would say, towards humanity through Judaism. Why should I do this again? Well, I think the big impetus was that many of our members, one, had not survived, or two, were in displaced persons camp, and they needed help. They were subsisting, they didn't have any clothes, they didn't have enough food. And so this, I think, was the catalyst 
that rallied members in Europe and caused them to liaison with refugee men who were here in the United States and in England and uh, get together, try to help these people. And they organized what was called Adopt a Family. And this was a program where people all over the country, the lodges all over the country and in England, were sending food packages and clothes and shoes to people, to Benabrith members in the DP camp. And who headed it? But the man who stayed in Germany, the theologian who stayed in Germany while other rabbis came to America and had been released from Theresian stat uh, just hours before the armistice. And that was Dr. Beck. And Dr. Beck was, he was 72 years old. He was frail. You think, well, why doesn't he just relax? But no, what he did was he headed this program and he headed the Renaissance of the lodges in Europe. And it was surprising how rapid that occurred. And even in countries where we had not had no lodges before, within months, six months of the armistice, a new lodge in Sweden, the Peace Lodge, and then all over the Belgium, all over the place that we had not any lodges before. And I think this was the, the idea that, yes, as long as people need us, no matter what happened to us, no matter how disillusioned we are, and I'm sure many of them were, there was no more idea about brotherhood. They still needed to help people. And um, with Dr. Beck at the helm, I think this was a, an amazing inspiration for people all over the world who were B'nai B'rith to reconstitute and rally. Well, Cheryl, we know so much more about our 180 years because of the important work uh, that you do in you. Um, looking through and researching our archives and other sources of information about our organization. Thanks for what you do, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you.